This episode was made possible by Brilliant. Hi everyone, Jade here. The conservation of momentum is a phrase that pops up everywhere in physics. If used correctly, it can make seemingly impossible problems quite easy. In this video, we're going to show the conservation of momentum in two different ways. The first by Newton's laws, and the second with relativity. Hopefully at least one of them jives with you. So first, what is the conservation of momentum? So the conservation of momentum is a fundamental law of physics in which the momentum of a system is conserved if there are no external forces acting on the system. What does that mean? So before we get into the conservation of momentum as a whole, let's remind ourselves about what the words mean separately. What is momentum and what does it mean for it to be conserved? Well, when we want to describe the way things move, sometimes it's not enough to say how fast they're going. Sometimes we have to talk about how much oomph they have in case they run into us. You know there's a big difference between me throwing a baseball at you and a professional baseball pitcher doing the same. Why? Because the professional baseball player can throw much faster than I can. And so unless you're a good catcher, it might hurt a little. So clearly the speed of an object affects how much oomph it has when it's moving. But this isn't the whole story. Imagine I throw a basketball at you. Not too much to worry about. Now imagine I throw an anvil at you at the same speed. You might need to brace a little before you catch it. Even though I threw them both at the same speed, the anvil carried more oomph with it. Your intuition is probably telling you that it's because it's heavier, or said another way, it has more mass. So the amount of oomph something has depends on its speed, but it also depends on how massive it is. This oomph is what physicists call momentum. So if we put this into equation form, we get that the momentum of an object is equal to its mass times its velocity. I have no idea why, but momentum is usually represented by a P. So now that we've got a good idea of what momentum is, what does it mean for it to be conserved? Well, in physics, conservation refers to a value that does not change over time. For example, my cat's happiness before and after I leave the house. He doesn't care whether I'm there or not, so his happiness value does not change before or after the event. It is conserved. In the same way, a system's momentum is constant over time, as long as there are no external forces present. Now let's get to our first angle, because Newton's laws say so. Imagine our friend Cornelius is on a skateboard with super smooth wheels and a near frictionless floor, like ice. On this skateboard, he's holding a ball of yarn. Now if he's standing still, how much momentum does he have? Well, since he's not moving, his velocity is zero. So the total momentum of him and the ball is zero. Now let's imagine he throws the ball. Newton's third law says that every action has an equal and opposite reaction. This means that the force pushed on the ball by Cornelius is equal to the force pushed on Cornelius by the ball, but in the opposite direction. We represent the opposite direction with a minus sign. So here we have two equal and opposite forces. Now we use Newton's second law, force equals mass times acceleration and replace force in the equation by the corresponding masses and accelerations of Cornelius and the ball. Acceleration is just a change in velocity over time. If something is accelerating, its velocity is increasing over time. And if something is decelerating, its velocity is decreasing over time. The way to calculate the acceleration of an object is to take the final velocity, in this case the velocity after the throw, and minus the initial velocity, the velocity before the throw, and divide it by the length of time between those two velocities. We know that the starting velocity for Cornelius and the ball is zero, as nothing is moving, so those terms disappear. And the length of time between the starting and final velocity is the same for both Cornelius and the ball, so we can cancel those two. This leaves us with Cornelius's mass times his final velocity is equal to minus the ball's mass times its final velocity. Does this look familiar? Well, it should because we just showed that an object's momentum is equal to its mass times its velocity. 
If we add the ball's momentum to both sides, we get that Cornelius' momentum plus the ball's momentum is equal to zero, just like we started with when he was standing still. So, momentum is conserved. Now, the second angle, because relativity. When we hear the word relativity, we tend to think of Einstein, but there was actually another scientist who had his own theory of relativity way before Einstein was even born. His name was Galileo. Galilean relativity is the idea that the laws of physics are the same whether you're standing still or in constant motion. Einstein just added that the speed of light is the same for everyone, but let's put Einstein aside for now. If you stand still on a train platform and throw something in the air, unsurprisingly, it'll come right back down. But if you get on the train, as long as it's in constant motion, it'll come right back down as well. This always baffles me. I always expect the object to move backwards because it's not attached to anything. But Galilean relativity tells us that the laws of physics are the same whether you're standing still or in constant motion. And there doesn't exist an experiment that'll tell you which one you are. Actually, because the Earth is orbiting the Sun at 107,000 kilometers per hour, nothing is ever really still. Everything is just moving differently relative to everything else. So you too can observe this phenomenon by throwing something in the air, right now, unless you're accelerating. This brings us to a very interesting point. The speed at which objects are traveling depends on the speed you're traveling. You may have seen this without even realizing when you're driving on the freeway. The cars next to you seem to slow down or speed up depending on what speed you're going. Now we're going to use Galilean relativity to show the conservation of momentum. Imagine we have two balls of cookie dough with equal mass flying towards each other at the same speed, one with a velocity v, and because the other is traveling in the opposite direction, it has velocity minus v. The total momentum of a system is just the subcomponents added together, so we get p total is equal to mv minus mv, which is equal to zero. The total momentum of this system is zero. Why cookie dough? We want them to stick together when they collide, not bounce off one another like billiard balls. If we're stationary relative to the cookie dough balls, we can say that when they collide, the resulting larger ball of cookie dough will have zero velocity. Why? Well, this is a completely symmetric scenario. The mass of each ball is the same, their speeds are the same, so there should be no difference in the experiment if we flip it around its axis. In other words, you should be able to flip left and right and not be able to tell. If the velocity wasn't zero, you'd be able to distinguish which image was before the flip and which was after it, and the symmetry would be broken. So if the velocity is zero, the momentum is zero, which was the same as what we started with. Therefore, momentum is conserved. But this example felt a bit like cheating. Everything was completely symmetrical. What about a more realistic scenario where everything isn't so neat and tidy? Now let's imagine that our cookie dough balls are moving at any two velocities in the same direction. One is moving faster than the other, so they will eventually collide. Both of their masses are equal. Since we don't have the nice symmetry like we did before, the final cookie ball won't have zero velocity. So how can we ensure that momentum is conserved? Here is where we take advantage of Galilean relativity. Last time, we were in a frame of reference where the two balls were traveling with the exact same speeds in opposite directions, which gave neat velocities which cancelled out. This time, we don't have that symmetry. But we can move in such a way where we do have that symmetry. If we move at a constant speed so that we're catching up to the slower ball and the faster ball is catching up to us, there'll be a sweet spot, which is just the average of the two speeds, where the slower ball and the faster ball are coming toward us at the same speed. This is exactly the same as our first symmetrical scenario. Galilean relativity tells us that the laws of physics don't change as long as we're moving at a constant velocity. So if we measure the momentum before the collision, there is always a frame of reference where the total momentum will be zero. That is, where the balls are moving in equal and opposite directions. 
Using the same symmetry argument as before, we can say that when the balls collide, from our new reference frame, they will have zero velocity. Even though this wasn't the original reference frame, thanks to Galilean relativity, no matter what situation you are faced with, you can always switch to a different reference frame where the symmetry argument holds. And so once again, momentum is conserved. Hopefully these two different perspectives on the same concept has made it a little clearer in your minds. Which one resonated with you more, Newton's laws or relativity? I know I definitely prefer the explanation by relativity. Let me know in the comments below. Today we were presented with a concept in multiple ways, and although this definitely helps to deepen understanding, there is no substitute for working through problems, forming your own intuitions, and figuring out your own way of doing things. Today's sponsor, Brilliant, is an interactive learning website where you can do just that. Their introductory course on classical mechanics features a whole section dedicated to momentum, where you can solidify the concepts you learnt about today. You might even come up with your own way of showing the conservation of momentum. I always make sure to try my hand at problems while I'm researching for a video, because it forces me to test how much I really understand a concept. And although sometimes it's a shock when I realise I don't know something as well as I thought, it helps to deepen my understanding in the long run and build a stronger foundation. That feeling of really understanding a concept and forming my own intuitions reminds me why I love physics so much in the first place. Brilliant has over 50 courses in math, physics and computer science. The first 200 people to click the link below and sign up will get a 20% discount. Just go to brilliant.org slash up and atom.